Hello there. So in this video, I'm going to talk about how I became a computer scientist. So my sort of educational, professional and employment trajectory, how I got to where I am today, give you an idea about the kind of money you can expect to earn as a computer scientist. And hopefully this will be useful to you if you're considering that as your sort of career trajectory. So firstly, computers. There's always been a computer in my family household for as long as I can remember. My dad had Amigas and a DX266 computer. And I remember kind of looking up at his computer desk and apparently he remembers this child's hand kind of rising up above the desk, trying to touch the keys on the keyboard. Slightly later on, I remember consciously thinking, how does he know what to type into the computer? you know, starting a game and typing like set up or typing the executable name. I thought, how does he know these magical commands to get things to happen on the screen? And the kind of games that my dad played, point and click adventure games, uh, sort of flight simulators and that sort of thing, really quite interesting and immersive. Obviously you look back at them now and they were a bit crap, but as a child, it was absolutely astounding to me that this magical box in the corner of our lounge could do all this cool stuff. So I love computers. And at about the age of 12, I managed to sort of convince my parents to buy me a computer. Well, buy the parts for a computer. So I think I bought the motherboard. And then I think six months later, I went into the city center on a bus and spent all my savings on an AMD processor. And then I got the RAM and the case and stuff for Christmas. And I built my first ever computer by myself and it worked and it was a kind of really rewarding experience. And from that point, every Christmas or birthday was just some kind of upgrade to my computer. And weirdly, for one Christmas present, I got the Visual Basic 6, I think, student edition for like, it was about £80 and uh, spent my Christmas day programming. Um, yeah bit of an odd child really, but it was clear I liked programming, I liked computers, and it was probably going to feature in some way in my future career. So getting on to sort of education, I did a GNVQ in ICT, so Information Communication Technology. Uh, GNVQ, at the level I did it, I think it was worth something like four GCSEs. This is probably where it's worth mentioning a distinction between computing and IT. It's something that a lot of computer scientists really, really detest. Both valid fields in their own right, but it's really annoying when you're a computer scientist and somebody tells you to fix their computer or how to do something in Microsoft Word. Because yes, okay, like a computer scientist probably can operate Microsoft Word, but there isn't a degree module in a computer science degree called like how to format your Word document. So IT is a much more practical and um, software focused topic, whereas computer science is more about understanding the fundamentals of computing. So the workings of processes and things like that, and mainly sort of programming, everything from conceptualization of the software through to designing the software, developing it as in programming it, testing it, you know, every step of the way and lots of different fields in computer science, including networks, data structures, speech processing. I mean, literally there are huge distinct areas of computing and you can find somebody who knows something about one and nothing about any of the others. But while they all may be able to use Microsoft Word, they are not experts in Microsoft Word. So I did my GCSE sort of level qualification, my GNBQ, and then when I got to my A-levels, or I believe it was AS and A2 by then, one of my A2 levels was computing. And I did get an A in that, and I didn't revise for the exam because I knew enough about computing to pass it. That sounds a little bit boastful, doesn't it? But you get an idea of what you're good at if you don't have to put any effort in and you still get a good mark. I also got another high mark in electronics. I actually did four A-levels. 
and then I also did maths and physics and I did all right in those. At that point, you then have to decide what you're gonna do next. Do you go out into the world of work or do you go to university? Well, I decided to go to university because really, if you want to be competitive and get the better jobs, generally you need a degree. Now, there are exceptions and some very talented people start businesses or uh, work their way up through existing companies, but for the majority of people, you kind of need a degree. So then you have to decide what you're gonna do. And there were a number of things on the table for me, believe it or not, not just computing. I thought about studying law. It really goes to show how difficult it is to make a decision as uh, a 17 year old about a decision that will affect the rest of your life because I decided not to do law because I thought it would involve a lot of writing. Now that is a ridiculous generalization that changed the entire trajectory of my life. I think there are sort of formative experiences at school where you think, oh, I'm not very good at writing long passages of text, so I wouldn't be a good lawyer. Yeah, I decided not to do law. Now, actually, one of my other best subjects was French. I didn't see what I could do other than be like a translator or something. Again, generalizations and preconceptions. So I decided not to do it. And I decided to stick to the thing that obviously I had shown aptitude to up to that point. So I decided to do computing. I went to university, studied a BSc honours in computer science and electronics, but mainly I learned to program properly initially in Java and then later I think in C++. Although, do I use either of those today? No. And I also learned about internet communications. You had to design your own version of Skype and in implement the different um, protocols, I think UDP and TCP or something. I can't remember, it was a few years ago now. There was a unit where you looked at the kind of technology underlying um, search engines, how they actually mine information from documents on the internet and structure those and create a system where you can put in some kind of query and get some kind of ranked list of relevance back. Um, that was quite an interesting module. I also did compulsory sort of maths modules. I think one of the interesting things actually is that I embarked upon an electronics degree and uh, quickly realized that a lot of my friends were uh, designing 2D and 3D computer games and really, really enjoying it. Burning the candle at both ends, but uh, really producing some amazing things. And I was a little bit jealous about that. Now, one of the great things about university is you get these things called like free choice modules. So you can do some of these additional modules. Uh, so I chose to do 2D computer graphics and made a kind of Star Trek style game. So you get a bit of freedom there, but you learn lots of different areas of computer science uh, during a computer science degree. And it's that those experiences that really allow you to choose your future direction. You see what appeals to you and what you're good at, and then you can kind of hone your future module choices and ultimately your career choices. So towards the end of my undergraduate degree, I had to decide what to do again, stay in education or go into the world of work. And I essentially decided to put that off a little bit. And I was going to study a master's in computer science. Uh, just to stay at the university for another year before going out to find a job. A guy who I really respect, um, who was my supervisor for a third year project, a great chap, uh, he suggested to me, well, have you thought about applying for a PhD? And I kind of thought, well, no. I applied for a PhD at my university and was very lucky uh, to be granted a place. I studied a PhD for three years, um, learned to be a proper scientist at that point, I think, learned to program in MATLAB mainly, and the kind of key skills that you get are really to take a problem, really analyze it and work out what the requirements of that problem are, to develop your skills, your, it's basically like being a tradesman and having a toolbox of tools and knowing which ones to pick out at the right moment. So kind of developing those tools a bit more and really learning how to incrementally improve a, an existing system or approach 
to better solve a problem that already exists or a new problem that nobody's tackled before. And ultimately, as a scientist, you then have to write up your discoveries in an academic way and present them at conferences, uh, publish them in journals, that sort of thing. That's essentially what the basic scientist does at a university. And there are other things as well, like uh, dealing with failure. So not everything you do works. It's not a linear trajectory from just choosing how to uh, attack a problem and getting a result out at the end of it. There are loads of things that I'm probably missing out, but I can see this video is going to be a long one. So uh, I'll try and keep it brief. My PhD was a bit of a dream, really, a new area that nobody had seemingly worked in. My supervisor was great, had a really good time. You hear a lot of conflicting stories. A lot of people really hate their PhD, say it's the worst and the hardest time of their life. I would say it was the most enjoyable time in my, um, in my academic studies. So I did my PhD, I passed it, and again I was confronted with this decision. Do you now go out into industry or stay in academia? So up to this point, I'll tell you how much I was earning because I don't really care that long ago. I was earning about £12,000 a year tax-free as a student. And this is something that surprises a lot of people, but a lot of PhD places are funded so you get a what's called a stipend that is tax-free. Um, that's pretty reasonable. And actually, not, probably not that different after tax and all that sort of stuff to what you would earn in your first computer science job anyway, if you've just gone straight from an undergraduate degree. So from then, as you know, is often the case in life, I drifted into something. I basically drifted into academia because I didn't have a job lined up, but there was a little bit of money available to continue doing my PhD research to basically just carry it on for six months. So I did that and thought, well, maybe I should go and find a job. At that point, I was earning about £24,000 a year. And then following that, I asked around my computing department uh, to see if anybody had any money. I'm surprised but it did actually work. There were people in my department who had some money and uh, I was employed then in that job for about six years. It was in a completely different area to what I'd studied in my PhD, but again, my toolbox of tools um, was directly applicable to that new post, even down to the programming languages that I was using in the new job. So. I decided to do that and I was earning about 30 grand a year for a while at the beginning of that. So just to give you a kind of broad range here, if you're a, a scientist, an early scientist, you're going to earn somewhere between 24 and about 40 grand. That is essentially it. If you then get promoted to lecturer, some lecturers don't earn as much as this, but a lecturer will typically earn from about 40 grand to about 50 grand. Senior lecturer, 50 grand to 60 grand. Professor, 60 grand to 70 grand. If you are very kind of good in your area um, or you negotiate with your employer, you can earn more than that. There are professors who earn a lot more than 70 grand. And not only that, but you don't know what these people are doing in their spare time as well. I mean, Professor Richard Dawkins, he's got books and things and TV appearances, he's not earning 70 grand. I can promise you that much. So that's typically what they earn. Now I'm still a scientist and uh, who knows what the future will hold because one of the problems of being a researcher like I am is that you're typically on a short-term contract and uh, you know the situation there. I've got about four months remaining. Things have a way of working out ultimately in the end but if things don't work out, then I'll have to look for a job in industry, perhaps. Now, typically in industry, you can earn a lot more than you earn in academia. I'd say probably on average for a sort of general job, about 10 grand more. But then as you get really specialized, you know, there are people that allegedly, obviously there's a lot of BS that goes around, but there are people who earn sort of 80 and 90 grand doing very specialized things. And, you know, there are big companies, Google and Apple, 
obviously uh, spring to mind. I've got friends that have gone to work at those big companies and they earn a lot of money. You know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, it doesn't appeal to me. The money does, obviously, but I am not the sort of person to up sticks and move to another country. I am firmly rooted in my city. I have a house, I have a mortgage, I have a family, I have my girlfriend. I have no intention of moving to another country. But anyway, that's where I've ended up. I'm a scientist and I'm at a bit of an odd juncture in my career at the moment because I've been a scientist for quite a long time and there is a stigma uh, attached to that. Uh, I really need to think now about which direction my career is going to go into. But that wasn't the purpose of this video to give you, to tell you that I'm lost. The purpose of the video was to show you how I got to be a computer scientist and the twists and turns uh, in getting to this point. Anyway, I'm sure some of you might have questions about uh, me and how I got to this point and things that I've missed out in the video. Please do leave them down below and I will do my best to answer them because I know some of you might be looking to start a career as a computer scientist. You might currently be starting your academic career or you might be later on in life and uh, thinking about a change. I'm happy to try and answer your questions if you have any. My Patreons are scrolling down the screen now. Thank you very much for your support. I'd also like to thank George Foote and Magnanimous Meg who uh, give me very generous donations. Thank you very much. Do subscribe if you enjoy my videos and I shall see you next time for another one.